Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Section 7 of David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, there's a short discussion of a philosophical doctrine on the nature of God and the universe that not too many people buy into these days that was called back in that time occasionalism. And it was associated with Nicholas Malbranche, who was in a certain way a Cartesian and trying to grapple with how it is that events would follow on each other. So there's an explanation of causality taking place here. And Hume is not impressed with this doctrine. And quite frankly, many other people were, were not as well. And as we explain it, you'll probably see why, because it, it makes God pretty busy in, in many respects. And so he examines it in, in the course of saying, well, we don't really understand that well at bottom what's going on with causality. So he says that um, people, ordinary people, when they see extraordinary phenomena, they behave in a way that's different than most philosophers. So ordinary people are perfectly content to think that the world is the way it is and causality works and they understand it. And then there's things like he says, earthquakes, pestilence, prodigies of any kind. And, and now we know how these things happen, earthquakes, tectonic shifts, right? But there, there's other things that are mysterious to us and people do in fact often assume that there is some sort of strangeness to certain events and then there must be something behind that strangeness. So he says that they find themselves at a loss to assign a proper cause and to explain the manner in which the effect is produced by it. They, they don't understand how this thing that they're seeing came to pass. So he says it's usual for men in such difficulties to have recourse to some intelligent principle as the immediate cause of that event which surprises them and which they think cannot be accounted for from the common powers of nature. So, you know, people back in Hume's time would often attribute these things to God or the devil or all sorts of other things, maybe, maybe witchcraft if they were fairly uneducated at the time, uh, although there were quite a few people who were still believing in it uh, in, in the 18th century. Um, in our own time, we have other things that people will make appeals to, although there are still people who believe in witches even to today. And most philosophers, he thinks, will actually pull up short and they'll say, okay, either we need to say, well, we don't really understand this, but let's not attribute it to God, or we'll delve further into the causes and figure out why these things happen. And, you know, if you think about natural philosophers, well, they, they did that with diseases and, and, you know, eventually we figure out what causes cholera or what causes all these other sorts of things and we find remedies for them or earthquakes or pick whatever else you, you want. Some philosophers, however, he says, um, think themselves obliged by reason. So the thing that's really, you know, key for a philosopher using reason to have recourse on all occasions, not just on some occasions, on all occasions to the same principle which the vulgar never appeal to, but in cases that appear miraculous and supernatural. So they're treating everything as if it's miraculous and supernatural. And he, he goes on and he summarizes what they say. They acknowledge mind and intelligence to be not only the ultimate and original cause of all things, so that 
God would have, you know, maybe made everything originally and set it up and then it kind of goes along in its own way. But instead, the immediate and sole cause of every event which appears in nature. So this is occasionalism. And in the next sentence, Hume tells us that they pretend that these objects, which are commonly de denominated causes, are in reality nothing but occasions. What do we mean by occasions there? Well, so they're just the, you know, creation of a possibility for something happening, or they're, they're creating the time for God to actually get the call and, and is, a, is a very, very busy God in this scheme and, and make the, the link happen. So, you know, for example, if I drop this book, if I choose to drop this book right now, which I'm not going to do because I need to read from it, then God makes, it's not gravity making anything happen. It's God making the book fall. And I observe both things. I observe my letting the book go and I observe the book falling and I attribute it to gravity, but it's really God operating behind the scenes. And, and same for any other causal relation. They're merely occasions. And so he says, the true and direct principle of every effect, every single effect, is not any power or force in nature, but a volition of the supreme being who wills that such particular objects should forever be conjoined with each other. So if you think this out for just a second, what would that sort of God be? And what would his or her, its life be like? It is tapped into everything throughout the universe, including what's going on in our minds. And every time that there's something that we ourselves take to be cause and effect, that, that deity, that supreme being, supreme mind, makes it happen. We are merely occasioning things, but... The real story is that God is incredibly active behind the scenes. And so it's God's volition and occasions that, that work together. And he, he talks about how this would work for external objects, how this would work for the mind-body interaction, and the mind's internal operation. So we'll, we'll run through this fairly quickly. He says that instead of saying one billiard ball moves another by a force which is derived from the author of nature... It's the deity himself, they say, who by a particular volition moves the second ball, being determined to this operation by the impulse of the first ball, in consequence of those general laws which he has laid down to himself in the government of the universe. So God sort of made a script for himself, and he follows that script in every single little thing. If we go on a little bit further, the mind and the body, right? He says... Um, we philosophers advancing still on their inquiries, discoverers were totally ignorant of the power on which depends the mutual operation of bodies, were no less ignorant of that power on which depends the operation of mind on body or of body on mind. Nor are we able, either from our senses or consciousness, to assign the ultimate principle in the one case more than the other. So these occasionalists assert that the deity is the immediate cause of the union between soul and body, and that they're not the organs of sense which being agitated by external objects produce sensations in the mind, but it's particular volition of our omnipotent maker which excites such a sensation in consequence of such a mo motion in the organ. So, you know, it's one way of solving the problem of consciousness, isn't it? Or at least the problem of perception. How is it my eye is perceiving that light over there? Well, you know, there's some things happening and then God's volition makes it all come together. You start to see where this is going, don't you? What about the mind's internal operations? He says that um, they extend the same inference to the mind itself. Our mental vision or conception of ideas is nothing but a revelation made to us by our own maker. When we voluntarily turn our thoughts to any object and raise up its image in the fancy and imagination... It's not the will which creates that idea. It's the universal creator who discovers it to the mind and renders it present to us. So we're all carrying around this stock of ideas. And whenever we call one of them up, God is the projectionist behind the scene who, you know, starts, starts up the projector and boom, there it is for us. Or whatever, one, whatever sort of metaphor we want for this to imagine it. Hume says that this is not a very good way to look at things. As a matter of fact, he, he criticizes it. And you might say, well, why is he criticizing it? Who actually buys into this? Well, there were quite a few people at the time 
who, who did. And I suppose you could actually extend this to, you know, the idea of a Cartesian demon or, you know, living in a simulation or anything like that if you wanted to, except that usually we talk about there being glitches in that, right? So Hume says that th there's a big problem with this. One of the big problems is that he says um, they don't consider that by this theory they diminish instead of magnifying the grandeur of those attributes which they affect so much to celebrate. What are those attributes? The divine power, the divine wisdom, all of these things that we attribute to God. And if we're saying that God is like this, this poor guy behind the scenes constantly you know, reacting to everything that we're doing, there's something kind of screwy about that. But there's also another issue that he brings up here. Hume says it argues more power in the deity to delegate a certain degree of power to inferior creatures than to produce everything by his own immediate volition. Doesn't it make more sense that God would give the billiard ball the ability to hit another billiard ball and take care of its own business, you know, or God would create complex creatures like us with minds capable of calling up ideas without God having to be directly involved in it. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's uh, Hume's assertion there. He also talks about wisdom, takes more wisdom to set up a world that can kind of work on its own. Then he talks about two philosophical reflections that would also help to refute this. One of them is very typically Humean. He says that... Um, Though the chain of arguments which are being used for this doctrine were ever so logical, there must arise a strong suspicion, if not an absolute assurance, that it has carried us quite beyond the reach of our faculties. So our abilities, our natural capacities, intellect, reason, will, all those sorts of things that we have, even imagination, it's carried us quite beyond the reach of our faculties when it leads to conclusions so extraordinary and so remote from common life and experience. If we, if we have to leave behind common life and experience, we're, we're starting to get into what he calls fairyland. We're starting to get into the realm of almost pure imagination. And if we're going to imagine a God behind the scenes, we could imagine all sorts of other things. And, the, and you do, in fact, see Hume having his characters talk about things like this in the dialogues on natural religion. So he says, we've got into fairyland long before we've reached the last steps of our theory, and there we have no reason to trust our common methods of argumentation or to think our usual analogies and probability have any authority. Once, once we start opening the door to this, Hume says, we can really just imagine anything, and we've got no way of deciding between them. We can't count probabilities. The other thing that he points out is he says, we're ignorant of the manner in which bodies operate on each other. We don't understand force or energy. Uh, are we not equally ignorant of the manner or force by which a mind, even the supreme mind, operates either on itself or on body? Where do we acquire any idea of it? We have no sentiment or consciousness of this power in ourselves. We have no idea of the supreme being, but what we learn from reflection on our own faculty. So if we're kind of a mystery to ourselves already, when it comes to our own workings and faculties, what we have more experience with, you know, intimate experience, how in the hell are we going to know anything about the divine mind that we could assert with any sort of real certainty or even probability? We, we, Hume is saying we're, we can't. So these occasionalists, they have an interesting story about how causality works. It's not even really causality, or if there is causality, it's the divine volition all the time. But there's really no reason why we should accept this, according to Hume. 